All right, good afternoon and welcome to the House of Swing here at Frederick P. Rose Hall Jazz and Lincoln Center in New York City, celebrating the beginning of our 22nd annual Essentially Ellington competition and festival. We're going to welcome the bands down this great staircase here. And our first band is from Newark Academy in Livingston, New Jersey. Please welcome the Newark Academy Jazz Band under the direction of Julius Tolentino. Make some noise, folks. Here we go. Newark Academy, Livingston, New Jersey.
their director, Julius Tolentino. Make some noise for Newark Academy. Our next band is with us all the way from Havana, Cuba, playing an exhibition, the National Youth Orchestra of Cuba. From Havana, Cuba, put I in for them. Yes, indeed. Make some noise. Make some noise. from Kissimmee, Florida, under the direction of Edwin Santiago, Osceola School for the Arts. Osceola School for the Arts from Kissimmee, Florida. The director is Edwin Santiago. Make some noise, Osceola. Washington, Edmonds Woodway High School. And their director, Jake Burbigan. Make some noise, Edmonds Woodway High School from Edmonds, Washington. Yes, indeed. Like the purple shirts, guys. Our next school from Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, under the direction of Steve Spia, please welcome Sun Prairie High School. Yes, indeed, Sun Prairie, make some noise. Okay, from Plano, Texas. Plano West High School, here we are. And their director, Paul Pierce. Plano, Texas, make some noise, make some noise. From Lexington, Massachusetts, please welcome Lexington High School and their director, Patrick Donaher, with his great hat. It's a good hat, Pat. From Tucson, Arizona. How about a hand for the Tucson Jazz Institute? Under the direction of Doug Tidebeck, Tucson Jazz Institute, Tucson, Arizona. The Tucson Jazz Institute, make some noise, folks. Director Doug Tidebeck. The winner of our Dr. Douglas J. White Composition and Arranging Contest winner, please welcome Ethan Moffitt. All the way from California, it's our composition winner, Ethan. Yes, indeed. From Fort Lauderdale, Florida, please welcome Dillard High School for the Arts under the direction of Chris Dorsey. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, make some noise, Dillard High School.
Lutheran High School. Make some noise, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Yes, indeed. From Champaign, Illinois, please welcome Champaign Central High School under the direction of John Curry. Champaign Central, make some noise, folks. Champaign Central High School, Champaign, Illinois. And Ed Buller. And from Raleigh, North Carolina, the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble. In the direction of Dr. Greg Gelb. Triangle Youth, here they come. Make some noise, folks. Raleigh, North Carolina, Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble. Make some noise. Here we go. From Foxborough, Massachusetts. They've been here 17 times. The director is Stephen Massey. Foxborough High School Jazz Band. Foxborough, Massachusetts. Make some noise, Foxborough, Massachusetts. Foxborough High School, give it up, give them some love. Stephen Massey. From Snoqualmie, Washington, Mount Sy High School, under the direction of Matthew Winman. Snoqualmie, baby, here we go. Make some noise. Mount Sy. Mount Sy High School, Snoqualmie, Washington. From Denver, Colorado, the Denver School for the Arts Jazz Ensemble, under the direction of David Hammond, Denver, Colorado. Let's make some noise. Denver School for the Arts, Denver, Colorado. Give it up, give it up. from Mount Lake Terrace, Washington, the Mount Lake Terrace Jazz Band. Mount Lake Terrace, Mount Lake Terrace, Washington. Make some noise, folks, make some noise. From Byron Center, Michigan, the Byron Center High School Jazz Band. Give it up, Byron Center, Michigan. Here they come. The director is Mark Townley, Byron Center, Michigan. Give him some love, folks. Please join us as we go to the open rehearsal and question and answer period with Wendy Marcellus and the Jazz and Lingus Center Orchestra coming up in just a few minutes in Rose Theater here at Frederick P. Rose Hall, Jazz and Lincoln Center in New York City. We'll see you in a minute.
Welcome to Essentia Ellington. How's everybody doing? We're going to start the next portion of uh, the day. First of all, we want to welcome you all here, all of your great, these great students, band directors, parents, communities that supported you all. I'd like to say hello to everyone on our live webcast going out all over the world. And uh, with no further ado, please welcome to the stage, Wynton Marcellus. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you and welcome. Can y'all hear me? No? Then how do you know what it is? Let's get real quiet. So let's get real close. Thank you all so very much for coming. Congratulations. Welcome. It's a pleasure for us to welcome you to Rose Hall, Jazz and Lincoln Center. We're so proud of you all and your programs and your band directors. We want you all to have a great time. We want you to participate. We want you to meet fellow students that are serious, uh, that have, are doing the same things you're doing. You're going to establish some bonds here that you'll have for a lifetime. I can tell you, I still unfortunately see people that I saw when I was 14 or 15. And sometimes we like each other and sometimes we do. When you get past a certain age, everybody you see that you knew then, you love now. It's just what happens. So please, I encourage you to participate and be a part of everything that's going on. Now, we have a program, we'll play music. We're mainly here to answer questions that you all might have and to assist you in any way. I'm not the only one to answer the questions. If you have questions of any of us up here, we got the hammer up here too, so. <laughs> if you have questions. <laughs> we, this is the first time that he's playing with us. We're actually rehearsing now. But if you have questions for us, stop us ask us questions. When you see us just around the festival, ask us questions, inquire about things. We're here to help you and assist you. And it's our honor to, to do what we can to improve your musicianship and your citizenship. Cats have already played a few, a few songs. We're gonna, let's just start by turning Walter loose. This is Ready Go from Toot Sweet. Just Walter Blanding is going to play for a real long time. That's a good way to warm up. <laughs> and then... <laughs> How are we going to... What you want to do in the end? The, the, the ending. I, I'll just stand up and do it. Okay. Ready, Go. Too sweet, Duke Ellington.
Walter Blanding. Walter Blanding, good warm up. Jeff Hamilton. And the rest of us. Okay, that was a pretty good warm up. That's what we're about swinging. Do y'all have any questions for consideration or anything? Please go to the microphones. Don't be shy. No question is too intelligent or too the other kind. Yes, we have the mics on both sides, so we don't want to just see only this side. Yes. All right. Um, my first question is, um, how do you stay relevant in the New York scene with like all this like young talent that's coming up? Okay, what does relevant mean? <laughs> like, like having your name and people's like people talking about you and like all this guys. You, you know, up. if you go to school next week and you get naked and get into a fight on the table, you're gonna be relevant. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you realize that? <laughs> The first thing is be relevant to yourself. That's number one. The first step on the road to, to being re relevant is be relevant to yourself. Establish what you're interested in doing and what means what. The meaning of things is very important to whether you're relevant or not. So I'll just ask you a question. I'll go back in history. Bach at one point was reduced from a music teacher to a math teacher. Oh. He, he was. <laughs> I mean, okay, Vic was a math teacher, so. In his system, he, he taught music and then he wrote the St. Saint, Saint Matthew's Passion and because the music was so great, he was reduced. We don't want you teaching music anymore. So at the end of his life, he's the greatest musician in Western music he receives a, a, a demotion. Was, was he relevant? <laughs> I mean, what you think? I don't know. When you go home, go online. And when you go online, I want you to look for a list of his music, the pieces that he composed. All right. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> And I want you to pull any sheet of it you would like. Anything you would like in his entire canon. And I want you to look at it and play it and read it and ask yourself, yeah. is this relevant? Right. Do, you, do you see the point I'm making? Yeah, Having your name in people's mouths is not always a sign of being relevant. Yeah. So I'm not against that, but I just want you to understand meaning is something that's is fungible, but... Human history has taught us that a lot of those stupid things can carry great meaning at different times. So, be relevant to yourself. I like you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, my question is more directed to Mr. Marsalis, but is, of course, applicable to everyone in the orchestra. Uh, Mr. Marsalis, I know you've had obvious major successes as a jazz musician, but also as a classical musician. What would your, be your biggest piece of advice for someone who might be like a classical major, but still wants to be like involved in jazz? The more music you know, the better time you'll have. It's always good to just learn things. Always define yourself by more than less. We have a tendency to say, well, I'm not going to be a scientist. When my son was 14 or 15, Vic is a math teacher, so I would be looking at his homework. Who you think I called? Okay, yeah. See, yeah. Vic, man, help me with this math. <laughs> Two hours later, we still, <laughs> we're not, I'm still. <laughs> my father used to always tell me, learn how to play the piano. I showed him. I didn't learn how to play it. So, okay. 
<laughs> okay. So I, I think that the more music you know, the, the, in any kind of music, it could be the type of music I hate. The more music you know, the more you know. So I, I applaud you learning different types of music and having some forms that are hobbies and being serious about one. Do it, learn as much as you can and participate in it. Join ensembles and play different forms that you would never play. You're going to learn something. Matter of fact, my father's here. When I was 13, I had the opportunity to play in a funk band. I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to wear those stupid costumes and dance around. <laughs> and he said, man, you need to join the band. And I did. I had a great time. That was great advice he gave me. So that's what I, what I think. Yes, sir. This is a question directed more towards Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Enriquez. Um, how do you guys keep such a good marriage when you guys play? <laughs> and um, what, what would you say is a good method to work on that with you know, a bass player, because I'm a drummer? Take him out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think it's important to realize that not everyone is your best friend, so not every bass player is going to be your best friend, but you have to get along, and you have to figure out how it's going to work. So my, my concept is to know my beat, feel strongly about it, and offer it to everyone in the band, not just the bassist, uh, everyone in the band. And as Mel Lewis said, whose birthday was yesterday, as Mel Lewis said, he liked to feel like a big, oversized, stuffed sofa that the band could sit on when, when they played. He wanted them that comfortable. Not lay on, but sit on. He wanted them to feel that comfortable. And I'd like to, I'd like to have the bass player feel as comfortable also with the beat. And, and you know, they're, they're, I don't like to discuss on top of the beat, behind the beat. I think the beat is this wide. If you have a big beat and it, it's that big to crawl into, it's room for everybody to crawl into that beat. And not everybody has to hit it exactly pinpointed. When the stick hits a cymbal, the finger doesn't have to come off the string. As long as you can play together, and, and if you're flamming, I had an experience once with, with Monty Budwig, a great bassist, and he was this far ahead of me, and, and I was ready to talk to him at the end of the break. I was 24 years old. So I walked up to him, and, I, and I'm ready to say something. He turned around, and he says, Young blood, you sure sound good tonight, man. And I said, You too. <laughs> so, so the point of that is, who are we to determine who's on top of the beat, behind the beat, dragging, whatever? Because by the time you start analyzing that, the band has passed you by. So that's my answer. And, and by the way, I gave him 10 bucks to play with me tonight. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just going to, everything he said is completely what I would say. Um, I've known Mr. Hamilton since I was a young musician and heard him play many times. So I knew coming into the situation that I w it would feel comfortable. But as a bass player, you know, like he said, there's no forward and back motion. You know, you, once you feel the beat, you know, it should be wide enough for you to extend yourself in there. So, you know, the egoness on stage has to always be control, especially between drums and bass. If you don't control that, it won't sound good. So you just got to find the happy medium. Thank you. For Mr. Marsalis, it's a bit of a more general question, but I wanted to ask you, at what point was it um, where you realized that your artistic vision and what you had to offer as an artist was number one unique? And number two, something that other people would enjoy listening to and derive inspiration from. Um, I'm just going to ask if we could turn the monitor down a little bit. Thank you. I think that um, it's the kind of thing you never know, because people will be complimentary to you even though you're sad. Exactly. <laughs> So always, I think, once, once I got into high school, people started to comment on my playing that I could play. But my father was always, he always only listened to music. So I would go sometimes and play with him, and I would circular breathe and play. And people would cheer for me, and he would just... <laughs> so when I would finish, he would say, hey, man, the circus is down the street. <laughs> And I think I was very fortunate because, of course, we trusted him. He knew so much more than we knew. And we also knew he was just about music. And at a certain point, I started to get recognized, but I really couldn't play. So I understood that 
Somebody has to get publicity. I got publicity. The question for me in my 20s was just how can I learn how to play? Already I was winning awards and stuff. And could I play as good as real musicians who could play? Like Woody Shaw or Clark Terry or Trump players who really could play? No. And uh, it was a matter of being dedicated to, to learning. And uh, so far as the people rallying around me, I think the one advantage I had over people in my age group was that I was philosophical and I believed in jazz and I never wavered. So no matter bad reviews, no matter what was said, I would be very clear philosophically. <clears throat> Another thing is I would discuss racial issues and be very serious about it. I was not afraid to state an opinion and to stand by it and I also had to take what came with it. And I took it. And it was a good 20 years of it. So Dizzy Gillespie once told me when he read an interview, he pointed, he had the interview in his trumpet case, he pulled it out, he went, <laughs> he said, oh. I said, oh yeah, man, I just said, he said, no, 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 no. A lot of this stuff is true, but be ready for the return. It might not ever stop. Then I was like 19 or 20, I didn't understand, understand what he meant. At 42, I understood it. So I think that because people could, could identify with my perspective, and I was always very clear about my perspective and always about the music and did not waver about it, it allowed all the people who believed in it to kind of say, hey, we might not agree with everything this, this guy is saying, but he is about the music. And in that way, I think uh, I was fortunate. And that just being around my father gave me an example of... Uh, what we were talking about earlier, is something relevant if it's not in people's mouths. Well, I saw him play gig after gig after gig for not that many people for many years. And it was relevant to him. So when I came out here, I was shocked that I got publicity and people knew who I was. I really was trying to be like him. And uh, everything has been gravy since then. You know, like, okay. And uh, I think it's a, it's a matter of just a, that and maintaining a seriousness and a belief. Because when you play, your philosophy is what you are expressing. I hope that helped. That Absolutely. Thank idea. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my question is really more for like the whole band, but more directed at Paul. Um, me being a baritone saxophonist, Joe Templey is one of my biggest inspirations. So I'm curious to know, as a band or as you as an individual, what would you say is the most important lesson any of you or you personally have taken away from knowing him? Yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of lessons to be taken away from that. Um, the biggest thing for me was just being next to him and hearing the sound firsthand. There's a big difference between recordings of cats and, but there were, we were just talking about the difference between like the depth of sound when you have somebody who really gets into the core of the sound of an instrument. And you can think that you even have it all, you know, like practicing, oh, this sounds good. But then you hear the real thing and what it's supposed to sound like, and you know immediately mm -hmm. that you are not even close to it. And that's what it was like with Joe. Absolutely. If you were next to Joe, you heard it immediately. That was it. Um, that, that was the biggest lesson to take from him. But he was also just true to himself. He mm -hmm. played how he believed the music should go. Mm -hmm. and. That's, that's the biggest, that's the, you know, the other big lesson to take away from it, is just really being true to yourself and what you think it should sound like. Cool. Well, we learned so much about music from Joe. He kept us honest up here, because he never BS'd. You know, we might fall into some, like Witten was talking earlier about the circus thing, you know, we have little levels of that sometimes, and he never had that level. He, it was always pure and very honest, but also as a person. He never, he never represented himself to be anything other than exactly who he was, and that was something that was very inspiring to me as, as a person. But uh, also in his music, he did the exact same thing. So we, we constantly thinking and talking about Joe. He's with us all the time, and, uh, you know, he's, he's constantly inspiring us. So, yeah, thanks for asking about Joe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. One time we, we were in rehearsal. This was back in more colorful days. I used to be very colorful in rehearsal, be very expressive. 
I was being very expressive with Joe. Yeah, Joe, blah, 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 such, 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 such. So Victor came to me after the verse, and he said, man, you know, Joe is like 68 years old. I said, oh, man, I didn't know Joe was. So I, I told Joe, I apologized to Joe in front of the band and said, I will never address you in any way except you're 68 years old. And he told me two words. I'm not going to repeat them for you, even though... <laughs> I used to love, we used to love to get Joe, ta- we used to love to get Joe telling limericks. We would tape Joe's limericks and send them around. So I don't want y'all to have a maudlin feeling of, yeah, Joe, Joe. Joe was full of life and Joe was deeply soulful and, and Joe also just loved and believed in the music. And uh, yeah, we miss him. Cats wrote pieces for Joe. Sherman wrote a piece, big solo for Joe. Chris wrote a piece, big solo for Joe. Marcus Prenner wrote a piece for Joe. Like when we start to write original compositions, everybody reach for Joe. When I would write pieces, I would always write Joe last. So the last word on what we would be playing, Joe would play. And uh, that, that, that speaks to what, what we felt about him. Yes. Uh, that's really great. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a question also regarding the saxophone section. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys could talk about uh, the, ba- the members who've been there the whole time. Uh, the, the shift from having Wes Anderson play lead alto to Sherman Irby and the decisions that were made to have Sherman Irby take the spot and the difference that it's been, like from the section, how it's changed, you know, from one lead player to the other lead player. Well, you have two different personalities, but the fortunate thing about it is that you had two great players and two great leaders. So for me, it has just been a matter of having the confidence to follow when you have someone in, in charge, like those two players, who understand the history of their chair and the history of the music, then they give you something to hold on to, or as Jeff was saying, he, they give you a big pad or a big beat to be able to follow. So um, while it has been different, the thing about it is more, more of it has been the same than it has been different. That's about a lot of things in life. And even when we have pieces where Ted is actually playing the lead as opposed to Sherman, it's the same concept. Sometimes we lead from the bottom where Paul has to lead, and then sometimes Duke will write so that Walter Blandon is leading in um, Such Sweet Thunder. I think it's the star- Star-Crossed Lovers. The tenor is leading down there. So it's been a, an educational opportunity and a great experience to be able to follow everybody at different times, and it keeps you honest because you have to be listening to the music at all times. And also, remember, we choose to follow. We choose to lead. I'm fourth trumpet, so I'm always following lead. Ryan left, Greg is playing. Well, I knew Greg when he was in high school. When, when, when Wes left the band, I talked with Ted. Because in a jazz band, the second alto is not a less position. It's clarinet, flute, all kind of things in that part. Russell Prokop's part in Duke Ellington's band, but many great parts. Ted told me, listen, man, If you can get Sherman, I'll play second. But if not, I should play lead. So there you go. I said, okay. He said, I can understand. Sherman, I'll follow him. But I don't want to follow somebody who can't play because you like them. Find a person who can. This is the short list of people. I want to see if we can get them in the chair. It wasn't vituperative when we talked to one another. It's just the reality of the music. And uh, so I called Sherman. He agreed to do it. So, you know, when, when Wes... Left Sherman came in, but Sherman, West, Ted, we all know each other. They've known each other for a very long time and love each other. And we know each other's musicianship. So when we make decisions, many times it's a very adult kind of decision. We, we're talking about stuff. It's none of it is secretive. Or, and, uh, you know, Sherman came right into the section. Yeah, he was playing. And he brought that pen with him, too. We didn't know about that pen. I <laughs> said, oh, Sherman, this pen. Sherman's arrangement was played down. You play as we, we struggle with arrangement, Sherman's arrangement come in, boom, you can just play it from the top to the bottom. It's perfect. One thing to add, while Sherman's playing lead now, he actually played the second chair under West for a period of time. So he understood that as well. That's right. Yes. I'm curious as to how you guys deal with nerves. Um, like going on stage with performance mainly, but. <laughs> hey, yo. You have no idea, man. I see, I see this man maybe once a year. He makes me laugh the whole time. 
He's crazy, man. I don't, I don't, who wants, does somebody want to talk about how they deal with nerves? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, th there have been times in my life when I've really had to deal with nerves to the point where I would cancel gigs because I would get so nervous or I would actually physically get sick. And I started actually studying meditation and yoga and, and different Eastern philosophies and, and, and breathing techniques. And for me, um, it's, I've, I've sent this to the kids earlier today when I was working with them, man. It's all about breathing. And if I start to feel, I still get nervous every time before I perform. But I take two or three deep breaths in through my nose, out through my mouth. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of breathing techniques you can study through yoga or whatever. Um, but that really helps me uh, to calm my nerves. And that and just realizing everybody in the audience wants to hear you sound good. So if you realize that, you know, that, that'll kind of cool out some nerves too. But, you know, everybody deals with that to a certain degree, I think. But breathing, taking like two or three really deep breaths just kind of calms my nerves down and, and really helps, helps me to deal with that. Just to, add, just to add to that, also you can derive confidence from the amount of time that you put into something. And, you know, if you think, I mean, everybody here has been put in countless hours rehearsing before school, after school, all kind of time, putting personal time with their instrument, getting themselves together. So, you know, you think about anything else that you've done for that amount of time, you don't think about, you know, you don't think about walking. You know, you put one leg in front of the other, you've been doing that a lot. So, same thing with your instrument. You put a lot of time into your instrument, and you get to that point where you start to feel and see progression and see yourself develop as a musician. You know, you can get confidence from that also, and that'll start to kind of, that also can help to take away whatever you might be feeling. One short thing to go with that is, don't look at nerves as being bad. The nerves can make you play better sometimes because they make you focus a whole lot more. One time we were playing with the New York Philharmonic. It was live from Lincoln Center. I think we played P against Sweet. And it was um, a situation where Kurt Mazur and Winston were gonna have a long conversation and I had a high D to play by myself on television live. And I'm just sitting, I'm trying to keep the reed wet, wet, I'm wetting it the whole time. Then I came in and played the D. And then afterwards, Winton came up to me and said, were you nervous? I said, are you kidding? He said, what were you thinking about? I said, don't squeak. And the last thing, well, I'll say this. I'm a very nervous person most of the time, but what I've, I've come to realize is that if you mess up, if things don't, don't come out the way that you intended, it's okay. Just be you. It's life. Cool. That's right. And a, a, lot of it, a lot of it, too, is the culture that you foster and how you deal with things. It's like um, if you mess up in a fighter jet, you made a mistake. <laughs> if you mess up on a piece of music, you're going to practice it tomorrow. So put yourself in time and space. We're just playing a concert. We're playing music. We're trying to make people feel good by playing. I find that whenever you're in a tight situation, put yourself in time and space. Now, if you put yourself in time and space and you are in a tight situation, be nervous. They're facing us with guns. Be nervous. I'm sitting on a bandstand with instrument in my hand. Okay. And for us as a group, we've been in so many situations kind of to have pressure. We know each other. We play with each other. We have a kind of love and feeling for each other. We can feel when each other is nervous. And we, we, we work with each other. And that's how you wanted to be with your band. Sometimes we play it good, sometimes we mess up things. But we're not, a, we're not, a, a, we're not, if you try to be perfect, you're going to mess up. Just be. And if you're serious when you practice and you're for real about it, when you come to play, instead of thinking, I'm going to be perfect, think, I'm going to be for real. Mm. Jerry Mulligan, once I was interviewing a bunch of musicians, I asked them, how do you play a great solo? That was the radio show. He said, I don't know how you play a great one, but I can tell you how to not play a great one. Walk up to the microphone saying, I'm going to play a great one. <laughs> so I would like you all to foster that feeling. Sometimes stuff happens. 
But if you stay for real, no matter whether you... I always love to listen to records where Louis Armstrong will miss a note. Paul, listen to the next five or six notes. Whew. Each one of them have like some, some Tabasco sauce on it. Like, I might have missed you, but boy, I'm hitting you and you and you and you. So that's what I want to hear out of y'all even this weekend. You will mess up stuff. You will be nervous. Do not feel like you let your band down. We're not judging people based on whether somebody squeaks on a clarinet or a trombone player misses a part or whether you came out perfect. That's not what we're listening to. We're listening to the intention and the feeling in your playing. And that's what an audience listens to. People pay money for a ticket. They really want you to sound good. And if you sound sad, they're going to say for the $80 I spent for these tickets, they sounded good anyway. We had a good time. So, that, you know, I want to always try to use this opportunity to recalibrate our, our attitude. And for us, we, all, we play together. Whether you're nervous or not, we're going to play this. And we do. And we've been doing it for a long time. And before us, other people did it. And are doing it right now. So I want you to think like that. You know, and one thing I'm going to tell you, another thing is to say, I'm not nervous or fake. Don't be a fake. Accept that nerves. Accept it. I'm nervous. Okay, I can accept that. That means I'm ready. And be ready. You know, that makes sense? When you sit up and say, I'm not nervous, boy, it's going to make you even more nervous when you have to do it. Oh, accept it. Okay? Yeah, you're right. Yes, sir. Um, so my question's a lot more general than a lot of the questions that have been asked up here. What is the best piece of advice that you guys have to balance a busy schedule? Like, I'm... <laughs> I never figured it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Let's see. First of all, Write it down. I, I come from, from a generation or two before smartphones and cell phones. And uh, so I actually, I write my stuff. I, I enter it in my phone, but I write it down on a piece of paper or in a notebook. And uh, that's, that's for a general monthly schedule. But... Uh, I, I also think it's important to like set aside, like you say, like a busy schedule. And if you're talking, for example, hypothetically, I want to learn to play the trumpet. And well, in reality, I want to learn to play the trumpet. So I try to organize my time. Uh, if I have a 10:30 a.m. rehearsal, I get up at 7:30 and I start fluttering my my chops and buzzing my mouthpiece. And I show up at nine o'clock and try to find a corner to not disturb anybody to start warming up, the best case scenario. Sometimes life happens and you come in at 1029, and well, there you jolly well are. But uh, so, but like writing it down helps, like to take it out of your head and, and onto paper. And if the iPad and cell phone calendar works for you, that's great. It doesn't work for me, I have to write it down. Briefly. And then after you write it down, read it the day before so you know what's happening the following day. Otherwise, you, you can certainly tend to forget whatever. So you got to read it, too. Another thing is that if you figure it out, call me. <laughs> tell me what I should be doing. You have to follow your young leadership. One thing I'm going to tell you all is good to do with your schedules. Schedule in time to do nothing. Don't Amen. get up, you know, don't, don't think I'm going to run 10 miles tomorrow and lose 15 pounds. You're not. Walk around your block. So put the amount of time you're going to be on your phone or you, whatever it is you do, play video games. Everybody has a, different things they do to waste time. Nothing wrong with wasting time. Waste your time in a controlled environment. The problem with wasting time is it starts to feel so good, you become a professional at wasting time. <laughs> Organize your wasted time. Hey, I'm going to waste three or four hours a day. You can still survive. You still have 20 good hours. Waste four hours. Now, if you get above four or five, you start wasting six or seven hours, even schedule that. Then you're going to identify yourself when you look at it. Damn, I waste a lot of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So schedule your wasted time, and you need time to waste. 
You cannot schedule every hour of a day or you will be in bad shape when you're 55. <laughs> okay, and when you do that and you get the results, let me know what happened. And let me ask you a question. How old are you? I'm 14. 14. Baby. I'm in eighth grade. Eighth grade, okay. So that tells me that you probably have a lot of classes and a lot of homework and a lot of extracurricular activities that you had to get together. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let me tell you something. At 14 years old, at 18 years old, at 22 years old, you have more time than you think. You have more time than you think. I mean, I know sometimes you get bombarded with a lot of things. I, I went through the same thing when I was your age. You know, I had this and that and this and that and the third, and I didn't know how I was going to get everything done. You just got to realize that you have more time than you think. Like the guy said, plan ahead. You know, if you have, if you know you have some, a project that you have to get done, try to get things done in, in increments and in, in, in days. Like take a few, take a few hours or a few minutes to get that done. If you have homework that you got to do the next day, do it when you get, you know, do it when you get home. Try to get things done early. You know, try to put things aside so you can do what you want to do. Do what you have to do, even if it means getting up at 6.30 in the morning. Do what you have to do to do what you want to do. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now that now that Sherman's read is dry, you don't have to sit down. We just this is a short one. We're gonna do time in of Athens. Fantastic piece that Duke Ellington wrote. It's the banquet scene. It's a beautiful alto feature. There's a wonderful video of uh, Johnny Hodges playing it. I suggest y'all check it out. I was just waiting for his read to get sufficiently dry. <laughs> Let's see about it. Sherman Irving. So, 
I guess this question could pertain to anybody in the band, but uh, especially for uh, the trumpet players in the back. Um, I play lead uh, trumpet in my band, and something that I think I feel like I've been uh, struggling this year is uh, relaxing when I play, and just could uh, you uh, give me something that could um, help with that, help relax? I can't see you behind you, so there you are. That's that's a question very, uh, very close to my heart uh, because uh, one of the things about you, if you're play, when you're playing lead trumpet, uh, you're, it's, it's more than just playing the note accurately, and that's something that I sort of knew years ago, but I've really been learning a lot about having this experience playing with these great musicians is that, first of all, this, the musical intention is the most important thing and uh, remember that we play, we're play. we playing because it's fun to play is one of the reasons we play. Uh, it's, uh, I think your question ha has a lot of layers to it. Uh, I, what, what, what I mentioned to the other young gentleman about writing stuff down, I mentioned that I try to like, give myself three to four hours before the first note of the rehearsal because they put their trust in me. They put their trust in you, their musical trust. And uh, so if you can go into that, that environment feeling calm, prepared. Like passion is great. Passion, you have a passion to play. But preparation is, what is the glue that keeps it together. So that's, that's my short answer to that. Thank I, you. I think I can help with that. I know. I'm a trombone player, but, oh, okay. you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that you can, but one thing that you can, you can actually do, I mean, this is true for all brass players, is knowing how, knowing how each of your partials feel, especially when you're getting up into the, those higher registers. You know, you know how most, you know how most, like your second, your second and your third, you know how those feel, those feel pretty, you know, pretty solid. When you get, once you get up to around four, five, and six, seven, eight, sometimes they start running in together. But I think it's the, the, well, the, the better that you know each partial on your mouthpiece, the better off that you probably end up being as a, as a lead trumpet player. And one thing that I tend to do when I feel like I'm getting tense is I take the mouthpiece off and I do what's called a pivot exercise on, on, the, on the mouthpiece. It's like I take it, I buzz, and I peel it off just a little bit as I'm buzzing. And then when I put it back on, when I put it back on, I realize where my seal is most comfortable in that partial. So then you start to know, okay, where's my point that I'm pushing in too much on, on my lips? You know, so I won't get ring around the, on, ring around the lips. So I do this. This is fourth partial that I'm on right now. And as I peel it back on, I try not to push it in so much on my lips, so I rely more on my air than my lips. And um, I think if you do that with each partial and see how, how good that feels until you get to a seal that's most comfortable on you, then you know, you'll start progressing. And you'll be able to play for longer, longer periods of time. Your, endur your endurance will go up that much more. Okay. Thank you. Can you explain your experiences working with a tap dancer and any advice you'd have for one? I can't, I'm good here, I'm sorry. Explain your experience working with a tap dancer. Yeah. Mm. Tap dancer? Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was, on, I was on Lionel Hampton's band in 1975, and the great tap dancer Bunny Briggs was traveling with us. And uh, he was pretty up in years at that time. I was 21, but he took me under his wing. And uh, we were talking about trust before. There's a whole lot of trust throughout a band, in every band, if it's going to sound good. Uh, so he trusted the 21-year-old kid to do what he needed because I was all ears. I asked him what, you know, to tell me if I was doing something wrong. But he was such an entertainer and embraced the whole audience, embraced the band while he was dancing that he made it feel so comfortable for everyone 
And I think uh, you're, you're a tap dancer. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's up to you to embrace the whole audience and be, be sure of what you do, be confident of what you do. And that sofa idea I mentioned before, just make everybody feel as comfortable as they can to welcome them into what you're doing. Uh, be musical with the tap. A lot of times I feel tap dancers are, are like uh, rudimental snare drummers that are trying to blow the windows out. And I think if you tap musically, it's a lot more exciting and of course more musical, especially at an event like this with, with the great bands that are here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Bunny, Bunny was a pretty incredible guy, very laid back, and he had one bit in this show that he would, he would shimmy across the stage, and, mm -hmm. and the audience would go crazy. They just couldn't stand it. They would start applauding, and he'd stop, and he said, no, no, I'll tell you when. And then he'd shimmy <laughs> some more, and they'd start clapping again. He says, no, 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 I'll tell you when. And it would be like four and five times during the one dance. So he, it was pretty, I, I learned a lot as far as entertainment value from him as well. But, uh, yeah, own the room. If you're going to tap, then own the room with what you do. Thank you. You take note about that. One other thing about tap dancers. Uh, when I first came to New York, I used to play at this club called Smalls down in the West Village. And we used to have a whole bunch of tap dancers come to the jam sessions. And there was this old tap dancer. His name was Gilmore. I, can't, I think it's David. Might have been the first name, but we, we called him Gilmo. And uh, he tapped and he did sand dance also. And uh, one of the things he always stressed to the younger tap dancers, when you come in and tap, you tap your choruses. Know the chorus, know the songs. You know, be a musician when you're out there tap dance. Just don't do your thing and just get in and out when you want to. Know the forms of the tunes. And he would have a lot of them to come out and play drums too. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's important. It's been around the music for a long time, you know. It's part of it. One last thing I say about tap dances is figure out what are some hip rhythms. Like, figure out what makes a rhythm swinging. Listen to people like Monk. Man, if you could tap dance like Monk plays rhythms, phew, you'd be doing something. It's mathematically perfect and swinging. So we normally work with Jerry Grimes. So we love him. He's like a genius. You know, just a form to what, what Sherman was saying about form. This guy, we, we try to figure out how to do as many things difficult to mess him up as we can. And he's always, boom, form. You just look at him and say, Phew. Also get your upper body together, too. You don't just be a lower body dancer. Goes with what Jeff was saying, Bunny Briggs, no kind of the tradition in history. It's a great book uh, written by Stanley Dance about dance. I think you check that book out. Just the history of it is fascinating. It has all the great dancers from uh, Master Juba in the 19th century to the dancers uh, to the time the book was written. Learn that history. Check it out. It's a great lineage. Yes, sir. Uh, so, kind of a two-part question for you, Mr. Marcellus. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> sorry. Um, I want to laugh, too, every time I hear that. <laughs> But uh, when did you realize that you wanted to spend your life playing music well, or, and, like, make that your, like, your career? And then also, when did you realize you wanted to, like, make this, like, this whole thing? Well, I think seeing my daddy struggle, in the middle of it, I wanted to do it. Yeah. I thought, man, this guy is playing this stuff. Not that many people. It's got to be something about it. You know, he loved doing it. None of us loved it. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what it was. And there was only four or five of them. In New Orleans, man, it's everybody handkerchief head and just trying to be something the tourists want them to be. And in the middle of that, it's like four or five people really serious about playing for, for six people or 12 people or something. I think watching them, the integrity they had, I wanted to be. Then I started to listen to the music. John Coltrane, one night my brother and I were looking at all of our records and all of our father's records, some kind of way we had them all on the floor. Now, we never would listen to his records, but we, we looked at ours, and it was like, you know, man, what could I tell you? Ohio players, honey, you know, I could go through the list of them. And we looked at his records. It was like people with suits on and stuff. We said, man, why dad his records? People look like they're doing something intelligent, and all our records look like that. <laughs> 
So it was a Miles Davis record, and the, the woman was beautiful on the record. I said, man, let's put this record on. I was like 12 or 13. Someday my prince will come. I thought, yeah, that's okay. Put the John Coltrane record on, Giant Steps. I said, man, this dude is playing on this record. And my father had a picture in our home of him standing with John Coltrane. I said, man, that's the dude that daddy and him standing with. Let's put this Coltrane on. Now, I knew who he was, but I, because I didn't know his music, I didn't know who he was. And uh, I got into it for that, and I wanted to be dedicated. I wanted to learn how to play. I wanted to help kind of the musicians I, I knew. So at that point, because I had been around these musicians, and they were all struggling. It matter was him. So it's like the 70s, you know. I would, I would meet the other musicians because they knew my father. Sonny Stitt had an impact on me. Clark Terry, it doesn't matter. You could, could name the list of musicians he played with. So that's, that's what got me into it. Now, we all come into the music in different ways. You know, some of us have... Uh, fathers and, and mothers that are musicians, Ted Nash and I have a similar familiar experience. Uh, Walter's father and mother, Elliot's father and mother played, so on and so forth. Uh, Paul's father plays, plays bass. It, it, we, all, we all have different ways, but Victor came into the music in a different way. And uh, we, we find a seriousness or a desire to do something at different times. I found it not because I thought you would get publicity doing it. As a matter of fact, I was sure you could not get publicity doing that. <laughs> and um, that, that, that's what I was into. De de dealing with the one thing is because I had, so, had the example of my father who practiced, who was serious, he wasn't so much telling you to practice. He was going to practice. Mm. So if you didn't practice, you, okay. You sound sad. You don't practice. Don't be mad. <laughs> one thing he would always say, your sadness is based on the amount of practicing you're doing. Why are you sad? Because you don't practice. You will remain sad until you practice. Then you will become better, and maybe you go from sad to okay. <laughs> and it was never a big deal. You're still, a, you're still my son. I love you. You're not a bad person because you're sad. You're just sad. <laughs> so your sadness was a matter of fact. It wasn't like something we're going to negotiate or talk about. Well, you're sad. You can't play. Once I, I was talking about it, he, he always wanted me to study with a New Orleans trumpet player named, named Teddy Riley. They called him Buck. I said, you call Buck? I never call Buck. Call Buck and learn how to play traditional music. Man, nobody want to play traditional music, all that skinning and grinning they're doing. Man, call Buck. Call Buck. I never call Buck. One day we're sitting out at the table. He said, did you call Buck? No, man, I'm not calling Buck. Buck can't even read. He said, man, people can play or they can't play. You can read. <laughs> so, you know, because I had that type of example always around me, I was fortunate. I understood what it meant to be serious or not to be serious. And uh, that's, I hope that's close to what you was. Is that? Yeah. Okay. You got your blue on. <laughs> right? You, are you, did I answer what you was at? Well, yeah. No? And then the other, the other thing was uh, when did you decide you wanted to make this festival? Well, I didn't make it. You know, we all made it. It's a lot of us involved in it. It's like the music we make. If you were the only one making something, it's not going to be that good. John Lewis, a great piano player, I used to go to his house, man, for lunch. I, I miss him so much. He told me one time, he said, for you, I have some time. For the music, I have all the time in the world. We all worked on this. It's many of us who are, who are around now worked on this. I came to Lincoln Center. I didn't, even know, I didn't even know Julia was a part of Lincoln Center when I went. Uh, my knowledge of it grew. And there are many of us who you will see around, our board members, who contributed time, money, expertise. They killed themselves to put this up. Acousticians, architects. We, when we went to open this hall, we, couldn't, we didn't have enough money to pay the electricians. One of the electricians said, man, I live down the street from John Coltrane's house in Long Island. We're going to finish this. This happens all the time. You know, you, you, what we work on is a band. If the band is about me, the band became great when everybody started writing music, when everybody started to participate, when everyone's voice is heard. When you understand the difference, sometimes we have a tendency in America because we celebrate individuals who have called it a personality. For me, because I received so much publicity so young, and because my father never really respected that. Not the fact that I received it, it in general. He didn't care about that. My mother was not a person who just celebrate you because you got some publicity or you made some money. That wasn't their value system. Mm. I understood that, you, the, that 
We, we are under the illusion that we're fighting for very few resources. The truth is there are unlimited resources. And every time we create opportunities for other people, there's even more resources. My older brother used to always have a joke with me when I wanted to eat more food. Man, I want some more. I want some more. He would take some food off of his plate and put it in my plate and say, now we have more. It was a joke like between kids, but the, the, when, you, when you can get out of the cycle of, of, uh, of exploitation, when you, can, when you allow yourself to think, wow, there, there's a lot out here for all of us. Like, does it take away from this presentation because I'm not talking the whole two hours? Man, Jeff Hamilton is going to talk. Sherman is going to talk. This man is going to come in. We were at a gig not too long ago, and Jeff came, him, him and, and John Clayton came, and they came and sat in with us and played and taught for us. We, we had run out of, we couldn't teach this particular day. We just called them a few days before they came up and taught. Was the gig less because they came? The gig was so much more. And think of that about all of y'all. I see students that were here. Tatum Greenblatt, I remember him. He's sitting in the back. I can remember him being 16 or 17 when he came in 1999 for essentially Ellington, playing the trumpet. I thought, man, this guy can play. Brandon Lee was from Houston, so yeah, had a trumpet player from Houston, one from Seattle. Fantastic. Our field is greater because of him. And if we can make space for him and recognize him, we are greater. So when you look at this, we all built this. I was somewhat of a catalyst because I believe in all of us working together. Like, I'm, I'm happy to play Sherman's music and to hear him play. Like, I'm happy to sit up here. The cult of the personality sometimes demands that some one person is, but it's never one person. If it is, it's not worth that. Trust me. Always beware of that one person. It's too much for a person to carry. But once you start to realize, hey, we all are there. We all have aspirations. Let's find mutual objectives and let's achieve our mutual objectives for each other. We don't have to all agree because we have mutual objectives. I'm giving you a long answer only because it's a serious subject and it's involved with a band. Yeah. Your band yeah. becomes greater when you understand, hey, I'm one of four trumpet players. Marcus Printer once said in a rehearsal, he said, man, any one of us might not be able to play it, but if you put us all together, you have one hell of a trumpet player. <laughs> you know, I think we're talking about a part that I said, hey, Printer would be much better playing this part than me. So he said, but if you put all of us together, man, that's a lot. Now, Jeff, he's reading. He's just coming and playing with us. We're all smiling like, yeah, you know, he's coming up. In, why? We have a mutual objective, swinging. He comes here. We're so happy to have him every year to come and judge. He comes with another set of knowledge, another body of information. If we create the opportunity for him to share that information with us and we make him comfortable sharing it, then all of a sudden, the me is a we. He says, well, I don't agree with that. This is this. Okay. And that's how this was. So if you know the dysfunction around us putting this up and how much we fought with each other, when we finished building it, we wanted to kill each other. <laughs> it took us about five years just to recuperate seeing each other. You again? We were out raising money and doing so much crazy stuff. Our chairman at the time that we finished, Lisa Schiff, we still look at each other and go, phew. <laughs> And that was over 10 years ago. But if you know why a woman gets up at 7 o'clock in the morning for a meeting about something and, and pays money to help create a hall, I, if I hadn't been a part of it, I wouldn't believe people do it. I remember when I first realized a board of directors and people were going to give us money to do jazz and dedicate their time and their expertise to doing this, it was so foreign being the son of a jazz musician. I thought, what? All we got to do is play concerts and sound good and try to... But there she was, two of us, 7.30 in the morning somewhere at a meeting, and we, both of us didn't know where we were going. So we met, she said, do you know where this meeting is? I said, no, do you? She said, no. We're standing in the building. But she was there for, the, for all of the 250 calls we went on. And we all built it. So I'm glad y'all are in it. I'm glad we were able to do it. I'm so proud of what we all did. It truly was something that everyone did. When you come into the House of Swing, it's about everybody. Everybody who's in here, we want to welcome y'all into it. I was just telling Tatum before we went on, figure out how you want to use what we're doing to make what we're doing better. Because at a certain point, we're not going to be here doing that. 
We started this band with surviving members of Ellington's orchestra, members of Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, and members of my septet. We were in our 20s. The Thad Mel musicians were in their 40s. The Ellington musicians were in their 60s and early 70s. The Ellingtonians are all gone. We're still here. And at a certain point, we are going to be gone. So we want the meaning of what we're doing to continue. It's a challenge for our country right now. And by right now, I don't mean this administration. We've been struggling with it for the last 30 to 40 years. Who are we going to be? And this music tells you we have to be us. We can't be one group. can't be the trumpet section. We were in rehearsal the other day, and I was saying something. Me and Victor start teasing each other back and forth. And I said something about messing up a part. They were out of tune, okay? They pull those flutes out. They start playing out of tune, okay? And they say, well, y'all out of tune too. So we start going back and forth about who's out of tune. I said, man, I'm just trying to tell you. With the saxophone section, I'm just trying to tell y'all. He said, hey, man, who is y'all? We're part of the same section. It's called the horn section. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, it's a, that larger vision is important. I'm going to stop talking now. I'm sorry I went on. Okay? No, thank you. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. All right, little brother. Uh, this is to the bones. So, um... Well, what are, uh, what are some fundamentals that I can develop for uh, relaxation, you know? Like, uh, especially playing in extreme ranges, but more, more so uh, physical relaxation. Well, one thing, one thing is that, that helps is from, you have to know every part of your process every part of your air producing process, every part of your, your, your playing process. So in the beginning of it, we have our inhale, a good, quiet, warm air inhale, which opens your throat, which, which puts your body in the correct position to breathe. All of that is something that you should, should learn how to refine. And um, so, you know, automatically that inhale, you know, that inhale automatically, if you, if you work on the sound of just that, the way that that sounds. You can get a lot of different sounds from your throat. <laughs> you know, you can do all kinds of things, but each one of those last two things that I did had tension in them. And that's the only way I got that kind of hissy kind of sound. But if you get a nice, open, warm, quiet sound, sound like, kind of like Darth Vader. You know, if you get that kind of sound, when you, when you, when you, a little quieter than that. But if you get that kind of sound and open your throat, that automatically puts your body in a certain amount of relaxation. If you keep, continue that amount of relaxation through your process, um, just let that guide you. That's, I think, the first step to it. At least I know it was for me because I didn't used to breathe that way. And when I learned how to breathe that way, it changed my entire outlook because I realized that this is a piece of metal and you can't fight it. And you're going to lose that battle. So you better just give it what, what it wants, which is air. And so the more that you... Start your process with a nice, relaxed, warm air inhale. Let that, amount, let that amount of relaxation, shoulders back, all of that be the guiding light for your process of, of, of blowing air. That's, I think, the beginning of it. And also, when you, when you practice every now and again, always look at yourself in the mirror when, when you're practicing. If it's just, just, just your face or just your whole body, you know, just look at yourself while, while you're playing and notice Look at things. Look for, look for your armature, the way that it's moving. If it's moving too much, you, smile, you got a lot of smile or, or anything when you're going up and down partials like that, the exercise that I t talked about earlier will help with that, that type of, um, you know, that tension in your face. You're just making sure that, you're, you know, all your partials are relaxed and going through each one of them slowly. Lip slurs will help with that, going through each lip slur slow. Like, like a roller coaster. You're always thinking like you're going up and down a roller coaster when you're doing lip slurs. Not necessarily focusing on the note, but you're focusing on the motion. Okay? And then as you look at yourself playing, do I look tense? Am I using too much arm or using too much form? If your forearm feels a little tense, you need to relax that a little bit and make sure your wrist is doing more of the work instead of the, instead of the, the whole forearm. Because, you know, when you start playing fast passages like that, you got to think about, okay, how am I going to get from one position to the next, you know, without you know, so much tension. So you think about three things every time that you play. You always think about the same direction, you think about the same partial, and you think about your closest note. You know, I always want to try and think like you're playing like a cellist. Mm -hmm. You know, the cellist, you know, they go from 
one side all the way to the next, one side all the way to the next, and it's all one clear motion, one, one smooth motion. So when you're playing and thinking about, you know, playing scales or playing passages, just think about different ways that you can go about playing that same passage. And then that will also help with your relaxation as well. Thank you. Now let's talk about the trumpet. How can we best use music to promote cultural unity between different groups, especially in probably one of the most tense periods in recent history? Be for real. All right. I've been asked to translate this question in Spanish. Can you repeat the question again? Huh? Okay. I've been given orders to speak in Spanish and English. So, <laughs> <coughs> can you repeat that question for me? How can we best use music to promote cultural unity between gif different groups, especially in, sen especially in one of the most tense times in recent history? Okay. Esta pregunta es para usted, para que, para que oigan. La pregunta es, ¿cómo podemos usar la música que tenemos nosotros durante, con, con los problemas que tenemos nosotros ahora en el sistema que tenemos aquí en los Estados Unidos en el mundo? ¿Cómo podemos usar la música para mejorar el futuro? I just said what he said in Spanish. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have... I mean, I'm saying it in Spanish because we have a, a group here from Cuba, from Horns to Havana. <laughs> Enrique, yo no sé si algunos de los estudiantes quieren contestar esa pregunta en español. Maybe lo puedo yo. La pregunta otra vez, la música. ¿Cómo podemos usar la música? para mejorar los problemas que tenemos nosotros en el sistema mundial. La música viene siendo jazz, música latina. ¿Cómo podemos usar eso para mejorar? Bueno, well, no, I'm telling him in Spanish. Who? Well, yeah, he, he just asked the same question you asked. You could, you could say it again. It's the same thing I told him in Spanish. Okay. He's going to answer it now in Spanish. Yes. I'm answering. Who's answering the question? I, I asked them. I asked the. I just asked them in Spanish the same question that the gentleman asked in English. So he's, you asked he's the, and that gentleman right there is going to answer this. <laughs> answer that question in Spanish. Okay. I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to answer the question. Huh? <laughs> is, are you? You know what? You answer the question first, and then I'm going to answer. No, he's not asking the question. He's going to answer the question. Okay. okay. Answer the question. Uh. Bueno, primero hay que ver el concepto que, que por lo menos pienso que todos los músicos que estamos aquí tenemos de la música, que la música al final es un sentimiento, pero creo que va más, más allá. He's saying that the music is more about feeling, if anything. It goes much more beyond that, but it's more about feeling. Es un sentimiento, eh, la música es algo que va más allá de política, de, que, de cultura, de problemas sociales. Music is much more than politics and anything beyond that. Y pienso que los problemas los hay en todos los lugares. He feels that this problem is everywhere. Eh, solo nos toca a nosotros los músicos. It, it takes us, us musicians. Seguir luchando y seguir luchando y transmitiendo. Uh, to continue uh, fighting and, and pushing the, the, the music forward. Creo que la música que, que toquemos, lo más, creo que lo más difícil en la música es lograr transmitir desde un lenguaje que pocas personas nada más conocemos los músicos. The hardest thing in music is to transmit 
um, the musical language to everyone else. Y pienso que el objetivo de este, de este festival, aparte de motivarnos a todos nosotros, mm -hmm. eh, sí, <laughs> eh, sea... Pienso que el objetivo de este festival, aparte de motivarnos a nosotros, eh, coño, me quedé en blanco. No, de... <laughs> sí. <laughs> aparte de, de, bueno, de motivarnos, sea, eh, pienso que rescatar mm -hmm. no solo la, la, la tradición aquí de la música de Estados Unidos, sino la tradición musical de muchos años de historia que, que eh, por muchas influencias que hayan en el mundo. Okay. He's saying that the historical fact of musical, the musical historical facts that, that the his, history has, not only in America, but in other parts of the world, even in Cuba, has a lot to give us uh, as musicians. Pienso que por eso estamos aquí nosotros los cubanos. He said that's why he feels that us Cubans are here now con, to celebrate this. Con nuestra cultura. With their culture. Y pienso que por eso están ustedes aquí con su cultura. And he feels that this is why we're here with our culture and your culture. Y bueno, eh, bueno, gracias. He <laughs> says, thank you. <laughs> now, I want to I want to break down something very basic that is important for the younger you are for you to understand. And it's a, uh, understand that the problems we have have cost people their lives. The problems we have, people have sacrificed their lives over these issues. Tribalism is something that is a part of the heritage of the world. It's almost like a test. Can you overcome it? It's very hard to overcome something like that. Our music has a key to it. It was the most integrated thing in American culture. Our music was like that. And our music has been very imperfect. When things become a product in our culture, they're sold to people demographically. People are dealt with in terms of I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that. It's very difficult to overcome a, a, a way that you are culturized. It's, it's, it's much more difficult than a slogan. But I'm going to say something that will be as clear as I can make it, that it entails sharing resources that you don't want to share. Share resources you do not feel like sharing. Anybody who was lived in a room with a brother or a sister understands that. <laughs> Me and my brother stayed in a room. I hated the music he put on. I hated his posters. I wanted to, to stay up all night. He wanted to go to sleep, listen to this music. But he's my brother. We had to share resources. I told you my brother would take food off his plate and say, now we have more. He didn't want to give me the food. We're great on slogans. We're great on the picture of people with their hands around each other. We're great on the product. But on the meaning, why? Hey, we have resources. How are we going to protect what we have? I'm all for that. I'll take 2,000 and I'm going to give you three and go pick up an award. We have to share resources that we do not want to share. That's the key to us coming together. Those resources could be intellectual, they could be economic. And let me tell you something, people who don't have economic resources have a lot to share with us. It may be cultural. Everything is not you giving. Be willing to accept resources from th those who you may have been conditioned to think are inferior to you. Question things. Look underneath these covers. And look at it when you see it. And come to your own conclusions. Don't fall into the cliched young people. Young people is young people that. You're a market that things are being marketed to. Rise above that. But understand at the end of the day, to create change is going to require something different and something that will be painful to you. 
It's not going to be any easy thing. Wait, we're going to all hold hands and sing We Are the World. Trust me in that. And I don't, I'm not saying it to be dark. I'm saying it to give meaning to what we are doing. It's like practicing gives meaning to what you're doing. Losing gives meaning to a competition. I love when UConn lost the game that they won up a hundred and something games impossible to do. They asked the coach, hey, what are you telling your, your young ladies now that they lost? He said, you know what I told them? I want y'all to think about how many times y'all sent people to their locker room feeling what you feel right now. That's what I'm telling them. And hold your head up. What you've been doing, ain't nobody ever won all of these games, but this is a part of real life. So the thing about our music is it puts you in time and space if you deal with it. It's not a music of illusion. It's a music of reality. And that embrace will cost you. It will not be free. If you don't agree with me, take my word for it till you find out. Because it will visit you. I promise you. Yes, sir. It's uncomfortable now because we're going from deep philosophy to something else. That's so, very comfortable. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the best way to deal with deep philosophy, with a joke. Hey. No. Um, so let me give you a scenario. You're in. Uh, you're uh, playing a tune. You're really into it. You're, you're with the big band. You're really getting into it physically. Like you're dancing around. You're having a great time. You stop. You look around. You notice that everyone is just completely still, focused serious and then you look at yourself like is my dancing causing a disconnection from the rest of the band is it causing a tear in the mentality of how we are working together and is that going to affect this is a jazz band <laughs> everybody's expressing their not can you dance that's the question your dancing could be so sad, they could be like, oh. I mean. <laughs> they might be looking down like, oh. So I suggest dance better. But I don't, uh, you know. You know, I'm, I'm going to add to that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, of evidence on YouTube about how jazz bands used to look, and a lot of these old film shorts and things, and they did a lot of movement. There was a lot of things, Lionel Hampton's band, even Duke Ellison's band, check out, check, and double check, you know, with the trumpets back there with things like this, but the, the great equalizer was that they always could play, and that they did all that stuff, but they were always playing, and playing their parts with a lot of precision and integrity, like they were really into it. So it's important that, you know, you can, there's, there's nothing wrong with expressing yourself, that's what jazz is about, you know, but make sure that whatever you're giving musically, make sure that that's in place, and that'll always balance that out. Okay. We got Carla. Is, is Carla still here? Okay, we're going we're gonna to put a little bit on y'all of I Ain't Got Nothing But the Blues. Miss Carla Cook.
the change of a nickel Ain't got no bounce in my shoes Ain't got no fancy to tickle I ain't got nothing but the blues Ain't got no coffee that's perking Ain't got no winnings to lose Ain't got a dream that is working I ain't got nothing but the blues When trumpets flare up, I keep my hair up. I just can't make it come down. Believe me, Pappy, I can't get happy since my ever loving baby left town. Ain't got no rest in my slumber. Ain't got no telephone number But the blue the rest of us. Okay. We're going to take a, cu a couple of more questions and we're going to end with the Sheik of Araby. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Marsalis. My name is Kieran Hitzman. I go to right. Dillard Center for the Arts. I play right. tenor saxophone. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Um, I wanted to ask, what did you learn when playing with Joe Henderson? <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe and I, the first time I met Joe, we were playing on the, on the, on the show with us. Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, Joe, yeah. me, um, Ron Carter was playing bass. So at the end of every, each one of these gigs, I was like 19 or 20. At the end of each gig, they would play on Broadway. George Benz was playing guitar. So they would play on Broadway, I would walk off the stage. Because I just finished playing in a funk band, I want to play jazz. 
So I would leave. It wasn't a big deal. They, I mean, it's not like I could play. So they were probably happy to see me walk off. So Joe, on this whole tour, he never said a word to me. Joe was very quiet. But, but George Benson would always introduce Joe and say, the very quiet but powerful Joe Henderson, when he, when he introduced Joe. So we played maybe 10 gigs. Joe never said a word. The last night we were on the gig, Joe said, why does he keep introducing me like that? So it shocked me. I was like... So he knew when it was time for the last song that I was getting ready to leave. So he looked at me and said, are you going to space on this tune? I said, I always space on it. He said, I'll space if you space. And we both spaced. That's what I learned from him. <laughs> I mean, in terms of playing Joe, the thing is, Joe didn't play that loud, but he played with a tremendous amount of intensity. So I was recording with him, but you know, you, you, I mean, he's Joe Henderson. All the harmony and everything he plays is so clear. But uh, I think that's the first time I actually understood about the intensity that translates on the tape is not volume. It's, and the intensity is tied to your intention and your knowledge. And I would notice when he warmed up, he would play all those kind of figures that he played when he kind of uh, extensions of chords and stuff, because he could just hear in, that, in those modes. And of course, when it came to playing, he was what he was. All of, everybody on, the, on that level is serious. So the one thing I learned from everybody, be it him or Sonny Rollins or McCoy Tyner, you could name the musicians who were really, really serious. It doesn't matter what, what era or generation you get to, they're serious. So you, you can keep learning it if you want, but that's what, that's what you learn. I'll space if you space. Yes. Thank you. Thank By the you. way, Dillard's going to swing this year. Let's see. Let, let, I like that you said that, but let's see if y'all are going to swing. The, the, only thing, that's, the only thing I love more than you saying it is seeing it. You know, it's like when, when I would be playing ball, we would, we would go to warm up and somebody would tell you something like, man, y'all wait for us. Well, we don't have to wait for y'all. We're here. And I love that. I love that attitude. I love to see it. But don't hate on other people who are swinging. I'm going to come find you with your glasses. I'm going to remember your glasses. I'm going to say, okay, you didn't know so-and-so was going to be swinging too. Okay. Yes? Um, I was wondering, on uh, pieces like Ellington Music that he wrote for like the sound of specific members of his band, how do you uh, maintain the kind of like uh, integrity that he had to his music? Somebody want to answer what, on a piece that Ellington wrote for a, a specific person, how do you maintain the integrity that he had? <laughs> I saw Winter do it. I said, do the same. <laughs> well, you know, um, we come from that, all of us here. We're here playing Duke Ellington's music right now, but so... The language of the music is something that we learn from listening and learning and copying, but we've got to the point now after decades of playing and, and uh, of being able to interpret things our own way, and we also have a story to say. That's the beauty of jazz. In this case, that we're playing a part, well, for example, on Ready Go, okay? So Paul Gonzalez is the soloist on that tune, and I studied his solo. I've studied many of his solos, I listen to the music, and that's important for a person to do, to be able to understand where the composition originates and what the composer may have had in mind. And the original recording will give you a reference. However, when it comes time for you to say something of your own while keeping the integrity of the music, there's a few things that's really important. Learning the history of the music, learning the recording, listen to the recording of what you're, uh, of what you're playing or what you're referencing to and also being able to have enough understanding of studying that person, in this case, if it's ready, go. So study the solo to understand the language of what Paul Gonzalez did. And then being able to, uh, to be able to make the bridge between being original and still keeping the tradition is something that requires a little bit of time and study to put a few separate things together. One is understanding technically how to play all your 12 major scales, exercises to learn how to improvise, 
listening to other great people who created the music as a reference to give you an understanding of how the language is put together, and also spending quite a deal, uh, uh, quite an amount of time working on trying to develop your own creativity and methods of phrasing and logical ideas, which is always based on a melody, not necessarily lick or just fast notes. And so when you put all those kind of things together, then of course you've got the tradition of the music in your soul. So no matter what you do, it's going to come from there. It's just like a family. You know, we come from our parents and our grandparents, and we grew up with them. You grew up in the house with your parents. You spend years of the tradition of the things that your family does. No matter how far away you go from your family as you grow and get older, you're still rooted in those first 10, 15, 20 years that you spend at home eating the same types of food or doing the same types of traditions and things like that. So I think that helped answer your question, yeah? Thank you. I also think that, thank you, Walter. I think that Duke Ellington wrote for archetypes. So one person will be a country bumpkin, one thing will be sweet, one person will be hot, Johnny Hodges is urbane, Paul Gonzalez is the way he is. And go to the musicians themselves. Cootie Williams said when he first got into Duke Ellington's band, he was just trying to play like, like Bubba Miley. And Duke was like, hey, why, 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 you gotta, he did his thing, let's see what you're doing, but why, 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 you got it. Duke said, be a number one yourself, not a number two somebody else. It said that when Paul Gonzalez auditioned for Duke's band, he played everything Ben Webster played. And when he finished playing, Duke said, man, that was great for Ben. Now what we got for Paul? But the thing is, he played everything Paul played. They say Charlie Parker could play every Lester Young solo on record. Just who knows that? So I find that the scholarship and the knowledge of the music almost always comes hand in hand with that type of originality because the people feel so great about the music, they have such a depth of feeling for it that it will manifest itself in a lot of knowledge. But the, the intent of this music, to go with what Walter's saying, is to, when Jimmy Hamilton played in the band, he said Duke Ellington would always tell them, Duke said personalize your part. So Duke meant that's what's written, but I don't need you if you just go read it, play something. So the, the two are not opposites, they don't fight, they work hand in hand. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I skipped over you. You got your Ellington t shirt uh, that's on fine, too. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so, jazz is a way of life, and like jazz is a philosophy of life. What is the most important thing it has taught you? Just everyone, anyone as a whole, like even for ourselves, what has it taught you? Well, I think it teaches all of us. Yep. Yeah. Be serious about what you do but don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> you can't get no better than that. We're gonna, we're gonna conclude now. Thank y'all, we're sorry we don't get your questions. We'll see you. Sorry, but I have this burning question I've been wanting to ask you for a while. What do you think about self-discipline while practicing? Okay, let me explain this about self-discipline. Get with me. We say it's time to stop. Let me tell you what self-discipline is. Stopping. You with me? You got a question you've been dying to ask. You know what self-discipline is? But I really want to ask this question, but I'm not going to ask it. That's what I think about self-discipline. You know what self-discipline is? I want to eat another one of these ice cream cones, but I'm not going to eat it. I want to play video games for another half hour, but you know what? I'm going to stop right now. You know what self-discipline is? Self-discipline, I'm really good playing these fast stuff, but I'm terrible on slow. Let me practice slow.
Thank you all so much. And congratulations. We are the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. Thank you. Todd Stone. How about another? How about it? How about another hand for the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra? Winton Marcellus. Yes, indeed. Take your seats. Take your seats. We're going to say goodbye to our uh, webcast audience now. We'll see all the people uh, online tomorrow at 2 p.m. for the beginning of competition part one. So, till we see you again. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the woman who really keeps all of the trains running on time here at Jazz League and Center. And uh, she's been corresponding with all of your directors and parents and, you know, coordinating schedules and tr everything from travel.